and really how fickle we are, honestly. Mm -hmm. We're reminded of this roller coaster of a spiritual ride that we are on. Um, but what Jonah did with his emotions this time provides us with point number one. The first thing is go to God with your emotions. So verses one and two, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry and he prayed to the Lord. So when he had that eruption of emotion, he went right to God. This shows growth really for Jonah. He became angry and displeased and he went to God with his complaints and engaged with him last time he ran when he had this eruption, he ran from God, this time he prayed. So we can see obviously this prayer that he then says kind of makes us cringe a little bit and it doesn't really sound great, but Jonah actually does what scripture tells us to do in Psalm 62, eight. Oh, don't have it on the screen. Trust in him at all times. Oh yes, I do, sorry, I'm not going fast enough. See, I'm not, I'm not good at advancing my slides even when I'm on the computer. Okay. Um, Psalm 62, eight, trust in him at all times, O people. And what do we do when we trust in him? Pour your heart out before him. God is a refuge for us. So it tells us if we trust him, we can pour our heart out to him. And it doesn't, this verse doesn't give us conditions. It doesn't say pour out your heart to him if your heart is in the right place. It just says pour your heart out to him. And that's what Jonah does um, here. Not yet. Um, and even Jesus does this in the garden um, of Gethsemane when he's getting ready to, you know, suffer on the cross. Um, there's a book, oh, I wanted to show everybody. It's called Untangling Emotions, and it's by Alistair Groves and Winston Smith, and it's, um, it's really good. But he says of Jesus, so, you know, in the garden, he says, my soul is sorrowful, even unto death. Sounds very similar, right, to what Jonah's saying. I'm angry, angry enough to die, he says. But this is what uh, Groves and Smith say about Jesus. He doesn't pull out, after he says this, he doesn't pull out an extra bottle of wine from the last summer supper and take the edge off. He doesn't stand apart from his emotions to get some distance and to seek to return to the calmness of his wise mind. He doesn't even start reciting his favorite Bible verses to preach truth to himself so that he can stay focused on doing the next task for God. Instead, he falls on his knees and pours out his heart to his father. So the first thing that I want us to recognize as we look at Jonah's story is that we got to take our emotions to the Lord. We got to go to God when we feel these eruptions, even when they're ugly, even when they don't seem ordinate and they seem out of whack, pour your heart out before him because he is a refuge for us. Um, God will deal with Jonah and the bad attitudes that come out of this. He's too loving and too holy to leave Jonah in this sinful place. Um, but being, since Jonah's coming to God, he's in a place where God can work with him. Um, when I, we were little, my dad always used to say when we'd be doing some kind of project and we'd be kind of like slouched and like holding the hammer or whatever, he would say, get in a position to work. And when we take our emotions to God, when we go to God in prayer, we're getting in a position to work. We're getting in a position to um, work on our hearts, work on our lives, and, and then have subsequent growth. And um, so my, mo my mom likes that she's telling me things over here that I should be saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, we saw Jonah's downward trend was facilitated by when he fled God. So remember, distance from God was the downward. And as he came closer to God, that was the upward trend. And that's what he's doing here. He's coming, he's engaging God. This is still an upward trend. Um, his emotions haven't changed all that much yet, but what he is doing with them has very drastically changed. Uh, all the points that come after this are more like successive steps of how we can engage emotions, our emotions. Um, this one is more of the context in which all of the rest of these steps should take place. It should be our Every step that we go through after this should be, and that's why I put in parentheses, with God each time. Every step we take after this should be in the context of going to God in prayer. This is how we walk with God. You know, it says walk humbly with our God. This is how we walk with him. Um, Alistair Groves, again, and Winston Smith. Our hope is not in a system of strategies we can enact. So, you know, these steps we're going to talk about. That's 
That's not our hope. We're grateful for an action plan, he says. That's not our hope. Our hope is in a savior and a shepherd and an ever-present help in time of need who sees us, knows us, loves us, and actually has the power right here and now to help us with the turmoil in our hearts. And this really is a stunning privilege. Uh, it's just like kind of an unimaginable invitation. He, they say in the book, which really hit me, would you offer your shoulder to cry on to someone who killed your child? I mean, it was our sin. It's these simple bad attitudes that we have that put Jesus on the cross. And God says, come to me with them. It's a pretty profound um, privilege that we have. They say, all of us are easily presumptuous, blind to the privilege offered us in God's call to pour out our hearts. Imagine the Father himself cares what you think, invites you to earnest conversation with him at any time for as long as you need. I don't even have a friend that's like that on earth, a human. Well, my mom maybe, but even she has <laughs> the limits of time. God does not, he offers us to come. This is a stunning honor, and yet we mostly see prayer as a tiresome duty. It doesn't occur to us most of the time that prayer can and should include simply talking to God about what is in our hearts. So when we feel things, we should talk to God about them and not just during morning devotions, but as we go through our day, which brings us to step one. So the context is going to God. Step one is name your feelings to God. Um, so let's see what Jonah prayed. This tells us a little bit. He's naming his feelings. Let's see what he prayed. Verses two and three. Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah is feeling angry. And he's telling God how he feels. He's telling God, I feel like I want to die. Um, he's identifying his feelings about the situation. So when we begin to engage our emotions with God, the first step is simply to become aware of what those emotions are um, and kind of put some kind of name on it. It doesn't have to be uh, specifically anger or sadness or whatever. It's just putting a name of some sort on what you're feeling. It's, acknowledge it's really just acknowledging what you're feeling. You can only engage something effectively once you know it's there. You need an accurate diagnosis before you can find a cure. So you just start by naming the symptoms. Sometimes we don't even want to acknowledge the emotions that we're having. You know, someone will say to me, what's up? You, don't, you seem a little off today. No, I'm not. I'm fine. I don't even want to really acknowledge the fact that I'm off. So maybe all you say is, God, I'm a little off. Not super specific, but as we engage him, he then helps us to draw out what's really going on. So after you name the feelings, then we analyze them again with God. The next step is not rocket science, although it can feel that way. Um, we ask ourselves, why am I having this emotion? What, and then the mo most important question is, what does it reveal about what you love most? So for those of you who have done How People Change, this is gonna get real How People Changey on us here. But, so why am I having these emotions and what do they reveal about what I love most? Groves and Smith, your emotions are always telling you something about what you are valuing, caring about, or loving. So as you analyze your emotions, this is the goal, to figure out what those things are. So I have some questions here. Um, to ask yourself when you're feeling an emotion, because it's kind of hard sometimes to do that. Like I, okay. So I, first thing I said is sometimes I don't even acknowledge the emotion is there. Now you want me to figure out why I'm having it and what it reveals about my heart. So these are some questions that can be helpful. Why am I feeling this? What am I reacting to? What am I not getting? What do I want that I'm not getting? What do I not want that I am getting? What am I afraid of losing? What am I willing to sin to maintain? What am I willing to sin to get? Um, where am I in my notes here? I was reading off my screen. So um, Paul Tripp and Tim Lane, they wrote this book. It's called How People Change. And if you're interested in this, if this seems like something that would be eye-opening to you, the, the whole book really helps get down to the bottom 
of these things and, and um, shows how you can have lasting change by dealing with the root issues. But anyway, they say, if I'm going to grow and change as Christ's disciple, I need a deeper awareness of the things other than Christ that I tend to worship. Our emotions are tied to our worship, so they give us clues to what we're worshiping other than Christ. So let's practice these questions with Jonah. Sorry, I'm not advancing here. Um, and we'll ask these questions of Jonah and what he's saying. So first question, what am I feeling? What am I reacting to? So Jonah says right off the bat why he's angry. In verse two, he says, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So basically, Jonah says, I'm mad because I don't like who you are when it doesn't serve me. He doesn't like that God is merciful to his enemies. He's feeling this way. What he's feeling, um, this anger, this wanting to die, is because God spared Nineveh. That's what spurred on this angry outburst. And he's reacting this way because he wanted Nineveh destroyed. So essentially, Jonah is angry about chesed, which that's what that steadfast love is here, where it says, um, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He, do, he doesn't like chesed now. In chapter two, he was grateful and happy about it. He praised the Lord for it. And he said that beautiful prayer. But now he doesn't like it. So already his emotions are showing us a little bit about where his heart is. What caused such a difference in these emotions about the same exact thing? Well, in chapter two, chesed was shown to him. Jonah was happy when he was rescued. In chapter four, it was shown to Nineveh, Jonah's enemies. Mm -hmm. So now he was angry about Chesed and he did not like it. He did not want his enemies to be rescued. So Jonah loved it when it served him and he wanted to die when it was given to his enemies. So let's ask some of the questions some more to see what is Jonah valuing here. So what does Jonah want that he's not getting? Well, he wanted vengeance. You know, Nineveh was evil towards specifically Israel. So he wanted vengeance, maybe some vindication there. What is Jonah not getting? No, what does Jonah not want that he is getting? He's not getting a God that revolves around him. He's getting a God that just is his own, whatever he wants. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I am. He's not, he's not revolving around Jonah's little world. He's not getting a God created in his image. Um, he's not getting that feeling of importance in God's mind. You know, Israel was God's chosen people. And now Jonah's not, you know, if God's going to extend this chesed to Gentiles, Jonah doesn't have that status anymore. Um, it seems like Jonah's mad because God isn't in his own pocket. He's not using his power and his love and his mercy to serve only Jonah's needs. Um, Jonah's, what is he afraid of losing? Superiority, maybe even safety. Like I said, Nineveh was threatening, so perhaps his th he felt like his safety would be threatened if God spared them. Jonah was willing to burn in sinful anger over all of these things. Um, those things were more, so if he was willing to sin, this is the last question, what was he willing to sin to maintain? He was willing to sin over vengeance, self-importance, and self-preservation, which means that those things were more important to him than God. Um, so Jonah's emotions are showing us what Jonah loves most, Jonah. And Jonah loves God only when God revolves around Jonah. Jonah's idol was Jonah. Um, I have here something Paul Tripp often says, you don't need anger management, you need worship realignment. And that's here Jonah. He doesn't need anger management. His problem here is not actually anger. His problem is what he's worshiping and he's worshiping himself. Now remember, all of this is done in the context of taking it to God. So as we, um, as we start to uncover some of these things, as we start to get bloody and we start to see, honestly, I think each of us might have different flavors of idol worship, but the, the big idol on top of everything else is usually self. Um, so as we kind of get bloody, we remember we're taking this to our savior and shepherd. This is the quote I read earlier. An ever present help in time of need who sees us, knows us, loves us, and actually has the power right here and now to help us with the turmoil in our hearts. So at this point, after this ugliness is start, Jonah's revealing this ugliness, he's named his emotions and he's starting to talk about why he's having them. Faithful Yahweh begins to patiently engage the painstaking process of working on Jonah's heart. Sometimes people say, hard work is hard work. And it's true. 
it, when you're, it's your heart, but it's even harder sometimes for the person who's working on that hard work, hard work with you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm working on myself and that's hard. If you commit to working with me on hard work, sometimes that's even harder because we're all pain in the you know what sometimes. Um, but this is what God does with Jonah here. He painstakingly walks through. Um, I was thinking about one of the um, greatest displays, like when I think about my growing up years of love that my dad showed me was um, there were multiple occasions when on the way home from a youth event or something, he would sit in the car with me until literally like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning talking to me and working through issues. And he would uh, answer my questions. He let me ask questions. He let me have little tantrums and then countered them with truth, always pointing me back to Jesus. And, you know, he different at different times grounded me or punished me or whatever, but the truest expression of love and the biggest catalyst then for my change and my growth was those conversations. It wasn't being grounded you know, not getting to go to the all night party for like four years in a row is not the reason then that I turned around. It was because he's talked with me and he worked with me. And that's what God's doing here with Jonah. And it's such a blessing, again, that God of the creator wants to do that with us. Mm -hmm. um, he wants to do it. He did it with Jonah and he wants to do it with you. Um, so after we name our emotions and we analyze them and figure out kind of what are they showing that I love most, then we can evaluate those emotions. In verse four, after Jonah kind of does some of these things, the Lord says, do you do well to be angry? So I put on the screen, do you do well to be blank? Do you do well to be anxious? Do you do well to be even happy? Sometimes we're happy about the wrong things. Do you do well to be sad? Um, he's not saying you're wrong, but he's telling us to ask the question, is this a good thing that you're upset about? This, this could be translated, is your anger justly kindled? Or are you right to be angry? So if I was angry about um, human trafficking and a denigration to the image of God, do I do well to be angry? Yes. If I'm angry because I'm trying to work and get ready for the word cafe, and my kids want to keep coming in a million times and interrupt my time and ruin my quiet and all this kind of stuff. And I have an outburst of anger. Do I do well to be angry? Probably not. And we could probably think of even more, um, <laughs> even trivial things that I would become angry about. Do I do well to be angry? No. And how do we judge what we do well to be angry? How do we know what this, what is the standard for right and just and good when we're thinking about if we do well to have whatever emotion? Well, obviously the standard is God. Um, we have to ask ourselves, so we name our emotions, we figure out what am I truly caring about with these emotions, and then we ask, are these emotions and values in alignment with the emotions and values of God? Are they in submission to God's word or are they ignoring God's word? If you've discovered that they're off, then we have to ask, are we willing to submit them and have them realign with God's way? So in verse five, Jonah's kind of backed up. Well, after God asks him that question, he's kind of backed up into a corner because obviously the answer is no, my anger is not justly kindled. Um, but instead of answering a question, he goes off and he pouts. So verse five, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he would see what would become of the city. So as a side note here, this is another emotion that he's having. He's showing hope. He's kind of still waiting to see what's going to happen in the city. Maybe God will still destroy Nineveh. I'm going to sit here and wait and watch. So he's hoping here. That he's expecting something to come to fruition that he thinks will make him happy. Um, he's still looking at his situation and this issue with Nineveh to be the thing that brings him happiness. He still thinks his plan is best, he knows best, and he hopes that God will soon get on board. You know, we sing that song, you are perfect in all of your ways, and we should probably end, unless they don't line up with mine, because we're happy about what God does, again, like Jonah, when the grace is being shown to us, but when he, his ways include blessing someone that we not only don't like, but maybe have been hurt by, we don't like that so as much, and that's when maybe we have some kind of eruption of emotion. Um, so when we belong to God, even, so Jonah's pouting now, back to the story. Jonah's pouting. He kind of went out of the city to see what's going to happen. 
When we belong to God, even these bad attitudes don't deter God from performing surgery on us, heart surgery. He doesn't wait for us to sign a consent form to treat our illness. So when we refuse to engage these steps like Jonah's doing here, God sometimes continues to force us through them. So God sets up an object lesson here because he's like, we're going to keep pulling out these emotions. We're going to keep revealing what your deepest allegiances are so that we can deal with them and put you on the path to abundant life. Um, verse six, this is where he sets up this object lesson. Using the circumstances of Jonah's life, I'll point out, like, you know, we sit here, maybe I have an object lesson with a cup and an egg or something, and I do something. God uses our lives as object lessons sometimes, and he's using the circumstances of Jonah's life. So keep that in mind as you consider situations in your own life that we think this is just all bad luck, or maybe it's God's providential working in our lives to show something to us. So we should always be asking, what is God up to in this? Um, so verse six, now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. So here's God again, using nature, controlling nature to show mercy. Um, he causes the plant to rise up over Jonah to give him shade. At the first read through, I thought, oh, that's nice. God provided comfort to Jonah, even though he was being a brat. He still wanted Jonah to be comfortable. Uh, but at a closer reading, as I looked a little bit deeper, the Hebrew reveals a really brilliant uh, artistry on the part of the author here. It's where it says, God provided a shade over his head. And then the next word is to deliver. Not Saul is the word in the Hebrew. It can mean to save or deliver. And then from his discomfort, the word there, discomfort, is ra, which is very often translated bad or evil. And the author in this book has been using it interchangeably. So he's intentionally making this word raw ambiguous. And then at this point in the story, it can be, this could be translated in two ways, which most of our English translations say, God provided a shade to save him from his discomfort. Or it could be translated literally just as naturally, God provided a shade to deliver him from his evil. So this can be, so I have here, God's primary motivation in giving the plant to Jonah was not simply to provide a shade for him, to deliver him from something as trivial as physical discomfort from heat, because the next day the Lord killed the plant. If he was really concerned about Jonah's comfort, he wouldn't, kill, wouldn't have killed the plant the next day. He kills the plant the next day. What does this tell us? God's primary motivation was to create a situation to rescue Jonah from his bad attitude. So the object lesson is to rescue Jonah from this bad attitude. Um, he's continuing to draw out Jonah's emotions to show him what he truly values, and then it doesn't align with what God values. So verse six, this plant comes up, gives him shade. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Mm -hmm. Jonah's very happy that he is no longer hot. Um, the source of the happiness was the plant, which provided physical comfort. Things that make us happy, happiness is an emotion, also show us what we value. So in addition to the anger revealing his values of vengeance and self-preservation, we can add physical comfort to the list of things that Jonah values. Still pointing to his ultimate idol, which is himself. So think about it. Jonah was glad and happy and no longer wanted to die because he received uh, this shade to prevent him from being uncomfortable while sitting and waiting for the ultimate discomfort, the disaster of Nineveh. The phrasing and the grammar of Jonah was exceedingly glad is identical to the beginning of 4.1 where it says Jonah was exceedingly displeased and it just highlights the contrast between Jonah's anger at the salvation of the Ninevites and his joy at his own salvation. It's all about Jonah. His concern for the physical well-being, his own physical well-being trumped his concern for the spiritual well-being of others. Um, and I just have here how easy it is to be more sensitive to our own interests, even trivial ones, than to the spiritual needs of others. We are more likely to cry over a pet or a sentimental object or some discomfort in our lives than we are over a friend or even an enemy that doesn't know the Lord. And it's, you know, when it's said like that, it sounds like 
ridiculous, but you know, I just painted my kitchen and I got a new fridge and it makes me really happy when I walk in there and it's all nice. And I'm more happy about that than I am sad about my neighbors who live across the street that are lost and clearly, as it says at the end of this passage, don't know their left from their right. I don't feel sad about that as, as happy as I feel about a stupid refrigerator. So if we're, and if we're honest, we all have a little bit of that in us. Um, and you know who I do care about that are lost? My close friends, because they're important to me. So we're very revolving around me and what, what's happening in my world. Um, okay, so verse seven and eight. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. So once again, it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm not, the Bible is. God is appointing nature to continue his object lesson. He's still sovereign over nature to teach Jonah a lesson. And I think it's interesting, right when the plant would have been needed most. So God killed the plant at dawn when the sun was rising. That's when he would have needed it most. And the scorching east wind came when the sun rose, when it was high in the sky and it would have been the hottest. Um, that's when God took those things away. And Jonah probably was sitting there thinking the timing could not be worse. Mm. And I think we often think that about things that are happening in our lives, like with this whole Corona, st everything. It's like the timing could not be worse for whatever. How many times do we say that? But is that coincidental? If we believe that God is working all things, what might look like horrible timing to us based on our own little kingdom timelines is actually God's perfect timeline. Um, so anyway, God takes away the plant, the source of Jonah's physical comfort, the reason for Jonah's happiness, and apparently even his reason for living. Because at the end of verse 8, he says once again, he asks once again that he might die. And he says, it is better for me to die than to live. So God has set himself up very nicely to ask the question again. This question is asked twice in these verses. So it's important. It's a main element or a main theme of this passage. Do you do well to be angry? So once again, he's asking, is your anger justly kindled? What are you angry about, Jonah? I'm mad because I'm uncomfortable. Do those feelings align with mine? No. So the first, I'm gonna do a little recap of everything we've done so we can go into the final point here. The first of the three major points that I've wanted to make that I hope that you've gotten, which I feel like you have because I repeat myself a lot, <laughs> is that our feelings go a long way to revealing what we love most. If it's not the Trinitarian God of the Bible, we are set up for disappointment. Knowing that this is true and loving us so ridiculously much, like actually ridiculous that he loves us this much, God is in fact a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. A God who not only orders the events of history, but cares about the condition of our hearts. And so scripture over and over and over again asks us to do the things that I've just talked about. It asks us to examine our hearts. That's really what all these steps is about. It's, it's examining our hearts. This is how we examine our hearts. Job, I have a couple of verses here just to point out how pervasive this um, command is really in scripture to examine our hearts. Job 13, 23. How many are my iniquities and sins? And then he makes this really weird request, make known to me my rebellion and my sin. Why, you know, that's not, I don't daily think, oh, I, I, I'd love to see today where my heart is at its worst. But that's what the Bible tells us to do. Lamentations 340, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. And then one more here, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. But a man must examine himself and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup. So this invitation to examine our hearts, to uncover our rebellion and sin and to probe our ways, it really is all for our good because look how each of these verses ends. In Lamentations, it says to probe our ways that we may return to the Lord. In the Psalms, it's so that he can lead us in the everlasting way. And then in Corinthians, we're to examine ourselves so we can eat of the bread and drink of the cup, which is where we find forgiveness and acceptance and new life beyond our sinfulness. So the point is not just the self-deprecating, 
introspection where we expose how horrible we are and then we all say, okay, everybody enjoy your Saturday. Oh, now I've exposed myself. It's for the purpose of new life and it's for the purpose of this restoration. It's really for the purpose of shuv, that returning to the way things are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And the context for all of this, again, is chesed that never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. You're not doing this in the audience of someone who might turn away from you when they see how ugly you are. You're doing it in the presence of someone who has made a covenant with you to love you no matter what. And that is a privilege. So I just wanna ask you today to receive this invitation to examine yourself. Like I said, we might find all fla different flavors, but a lot of, most of us worship ourselves and that's all of our problem. But we see here with the way God responds to Jonah, how he will respond to us. He's faithful to faithless people. He's steadfast when we are fickle. He's slow to anger when we burn in anger over frankly, very silly things. He is gracious and merciful when we deserve punishment and he relents from disaster and instead offers us his everlasting life forgiveness and acceptance. He offers us a loving relationship with him. And it's not every time I sing Amazing Grace, I've said this to you guys before, the phrase that gets me the most is that saved a wretch like me. Because when I think about how wretched I am, I can't believe how wonderful God's love is for me. And that's part of what Jonah missed. He didn't realize the wretch that he was. And so he didn't appreciate the love of God. And so then he couldn't extend it then to someone else who was also a wretch. So this brings us to the final point where God offers this last question to ask Jonah to trade his way for God's way. Um, after you have completed these steps of self-examination, we're at the point where now we can work to realign our emotions and values. Oops, I forgot this main thing that I wanted to say and had underlined here and I skipped right over it. So I'm gonna read it right now, go back a little bit. <laughs> God's dealings with Jonah are a stunning invitation to self-examination in the light of the standards of scripture in the arms of Hesed. So again, that's just that doing it self-examination in the arms of Hesed where you're not going to be turned away. Well, it really loses its punch when you do it out of order. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So God asked Jonah to, to trade his values for his own values by setting up a contrasting situation here. He contrasts Jonah's with his own. So verse 10, and the Lord said to Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, you did not make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. So Jonah, you have compassion on the plant. You care for this plant. The word compassion has this connotation of grieving over. So you're grieving over the plant. Um, you didn't make that thing grow. You're, or where am I here? You didn't sacrifice for it. You didn't labor over it. And then the thing that I think is interesting, it came into being in a night and it perished in a night. It's a blip. It's hardly significant. It came up and it went away. It's nothing. So let's compare your situation, Jonah, with mine. Verse 11, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons, do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? <laughs> So God's saying, I'm showing compassion too, Jonah. I'm grieving too. I'm experiencing emotion too over Nineveh, that great city. There are so many people there created by me in my image that I labored and toiled over. You know, Psalm 139, each one of those people he formed in the mother's womb. He toiled and labored over these people. The great, he's contrasting the greatness of Nineveh as compared to the insignificance of a plant that doesn't even last a day. The high value of people as compared to the relative insignificance of a plant. Later, Jesus even touches on this in Matthew 6 when he says, if he cares for a lily, which he does, how much more then will he care for you? So we see this relative importance of people as compared to a plant. And Jonas wants to die over a plant and wants the thing of ultimate value actually also to die. Uh, so, and then the last thing that he says, finally, these people do not know their left hand from their right hand. They're lost is basically what he's saying. They're living in darkness. They don't know any better. Makes me think of Jesus down the road when he would pray, you know, for the people who crucified him, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. We all like sheep have gone astray. We're lost and delusional, reckless, and we don't know any better before we come to Christ. Um, in Ephesians 4, it Paul describes people 
that don't know their left from their right in this way. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. And really, this is a description of all of us before Christ. And instead of looking on people who don't know any better, think I, I, I have a picture come into my mind of people that don't know any better. Maybe you have a picture come into your mind and what are the emotions you feel towards those people? Instead of looking on in disgust or shock or something like that, Yahweh looks on with compassion and it grieves his heart that people are living in this way in darkness and don't know any better. God says to Jonah, you weep over the plant, but my compassion is for people. In essence, God is saying your emotions and values are not in alignment with mine. Jonah's misplaced priorities look very foolish and self-centered in comparison to God's global concern for the fate of people. And then in light of this exposure, in light of this question, it's left open for Jonah to respond, to make a decision. Is he going to abandon his small and insignificant values and recognize the greatness of God's way to receive grace and then to extend it to others? Or is he not? Um, he's offered this choice. Paul Tripp says, I'm sorry guys, here we go. He didn't give me his grace to make my kingdom better. He gave me his grace to invite me to a better kingdom. And that's, that's what God's doing with Jonah here. He's not, Jonah says, it's all about making my kingdom better. Thank you for grace, God. My kingdom has become better, but that's not what God's doing. He's not trying to make Jonah's kingdom better. He's trying to invite Jonah to a better kingdom. And like I said, we don't know what Jonah said. Um, we, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Where am I? Uh, he's being offered. So God wants to invite Jonah to join in God, join God in his kingdom. And by losing his life, he will find it. C.S. Lewis has these two things that he says that I always, is a good reminder to me. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. If you live for the next world, you will get this one in the deal. But if you live for this world, you will lose them both. Sounds an awful lot like Matthew 6, 33, when it says, seek ye first his kingdom and the rest will be added to you. Mm -hmm. So God is here offering Jonah a better way. He's telling him to leave behind his way and come to, um, come to God's way. So he's offered this better way. And then we don't know how he responded. Now I've caught up with myself. Okay. Tim Keller says this. We feel that there must be a missing page. Why would the story end so abruptly? One commentator, like many others, suggests the book forces us to contemplate our own personal destiny. It remains unfinished in order that we may provide our own conclusion. For you are Jonah, I am Jonah. It is if God shoots an arrow, shoots this arrow of a question at Jonah, but Jonah disappears and we realize that the arrow is aimed at us. How will you answer? Just like Jonah, we are offered a better way. Our God calls us to love what he loves and to hate what he wait, hates. This might mean forsaking some false lovers in our lives and embrace the truest and most satisfying lover of our soul. Um, lasting change occurs when our heart's idols are unmasked and rejected. That's what we've been talking about doing. And we rely on Christ instead. Heart transformation comes when we dethrone ourselves and enthrone Christ. And this kind of change can only, only, only happen when we're continually coming to God and constantly drink, drinking from the resources of the gospel. We're not going to do this on our own and just will ourselves to rely on Christ. We rely on Christ by relying on him. We rely on him by going to him and constantly making it the mainstay of our lives. Um, a life that constantly considers, or a life that constantly considers Jesus. That's what I, I've been reading Hebrews in my devotions and something stuck out to me. It just says, consider Jesus mm -hmm. in the beginning of chapter three. Mm -hmm. And a life that considers Jesus is a life then that enables us to make that trade. When we consider Jesus and all that he has done for us, we are knocked off our feet. And again, we realize how ugly and sinful we are and how lavish God has been towards us with grace and mercy. And then as we realize that, we then extend that grace and mercy to others. Um, so just to end, I just want to consider Jesus. And I want to consider how Jesus is the better Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. Jesus is the best prophet, priest, and king. And so here we have an opportunity to see how Jesus is the better Jonah. Jo Jesus also experienced sorrow that we talked about in the beginning. Matthew 26, 38, my soul is sorrowful even to death. 
But what follows is, but not my will, yours. Jesus was sorrowful and was preparing to experience every kind of suffering possible, physical, emotional, spiritual. He wanted the cup to pass, but in submission to God, he accepted it and he didn't get angry. Which brings us to, this, to the second way that Jesus is better than Jonah. He accepted God's will and he endured the suffering. Why? For the joy set before him. And the joy set before him was this restoration of this relationship with us. And so that reveals a load of compassion. Jesus was the ultimate expression of the compassion that God talks about in the end of Jonah. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Um, Tim Keller says that Jesus is the weeping God of Jonah 4 in human form. He weeps for you and me. Jesus is the prophet that Jonah should have been. Yet, of course, he is infinitely more than that. Jesus did not merely weep for us. He died for us. Jonah went outside the city, hoping to witness its condemnation. But Jesus Christ went outside the city to die on a cross to accomplish its salvation. Unlike Jonah, being truly loving, his joy was to do all of this for lost people who didn't deserve it one little bit. Jonah wanted people, except for himself, to get what, he deserved, to get what they deserved. Um, and Jesus was actually truly innocent. He actually had the right to say, I deserve this and you don't, but yet he sacrificed what he deserved to offer us what we didn't. This covenantal never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love compelled Jesus to experience sorrow and true suffering, and then he experienced those emotions well. When we consider this Jesus, it's a no-brainer to abandon my dinky little kingdom and join his. So I'm going to wrap up this passage um, Actually, that's not by Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> um, I might skip this quote, but I'll, because I want to move on to the wrap up of the book. Well, I'm going to read it. Here we go. Michelangelo's painting on the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican portrays the prophets, apostles, and patriarchs. Of all the faces he painted, none has a more radiant countenance than Jonah. We wonder if Michelangelo knew something that we do not about what happened to Jonah after the sudden close of his biography. Perhaps the artist just hoped that Jonah did indeed accept God's pity and become a communicator of grace. We do not know, but what we do know is that our own portrait is not finished. And what will happen is dependent on the mercy we receive and give away in our own Nineveh. And so as we examine ourselves, and we do that in the light of God's love and his unbreaking love, um, we then can move to align our emotions with his and, re and really experience abundant life in that. Um, just to go back a little bit, if you remember the story that I told in the beginning about Dave and I and how there was something that happened between us that he needed my forgiveness for. And it was really hard for me to do that because it was so personal and costly what he, I felt like he had done. And um, it was when I considered Jesus and what he had done for me and the forgiveness that he had offered me that then I looked and I thought, we're both wretches here. And I was able to then painstakingly, this was over 12 weeks at our life group, we kind of worked through that book, How People Change, and it revealed some of the root values in my heart that I needed to repent of. And then see what God's values were and where he was and what his heart was for me, then I was able to extend that to Dave. And this sounds all real like, you know, oh, that's a great testimony. But it, it actually has had major impacts then not only on my growth and sanctification and looking more like Jesus, but it's brought life and restoration to places that had been dead in our marriage. And so it's, it, it is about looking like Jesus. It is about pleasing him. It is about all of those things. But since God's way is the best way when we do those things, our lives come into the place that they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And our lives then receive the blessing that living God's way offers. Mm -hmm. So I just invite you to examine yourself, get yourself right, align with God, and then reap the benefits of that. Um, yeah. So anyway, just in closing, I just had a few things that I wanted to wrap up the book with because I was going to do a separate session for this. But since we are all over the place with this COVID-19, I'm just going to wrap up real quick here. There's a couple points that we just want to walk away with. First thing, 
God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. Richard Phillips, he's a commentary I've used through a lot of this study. He says, to our surprise, we now realize that Jonah's flight had been in a straight line toward God's objective all along. God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. The detours of trial and even sin are shaped by God for his precise purposes in our lives, fitting us through an increased awareness of our own forgiveness, an intense experience of answered prayer, like we saw with Jonah when he was in the belly, and deep afflictions that end in blessings from the Lord. So all of these things have fit us for the sake of the gospel of grace in the world. With this whole corona thing, he's, this is a big fat crooked stick to me. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Why would all of this thing, all of this be happening? But we have to remember that God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. He's working all things, including nature, which coronavirus is a part of nature. Um, he's working all things for his purposes. We don't get it. And sometimes they seem bad, which brings us to the second thing that we want to take home from the book of Jonah, from that um, hymn, Behind a Frowning Providence, so behind the things that seem bad that he ordains hides his smiling face. And so in the beginning, I implored you to, you know, there's the frowning storm clouds there that we don't understand why they're there. And behind that is the sun still shining. And that's where God's smiling face is looking down as he ordains things that don't make sense to us. So let's think about how we saw this in Jonah. Um, where are we? Okay. God used a storm cloud, storm to save pagans. Remember, they, they um, repented there. He used the ocean and a whale to get Jonah's attention. He used hopelessness and despair to get Jonah to turn to him. He used a rebellious and hateful prophet to bring a great and evil nation to repentance. He used a plant, a worm, and an east wing, wind to create yet another form of suffering to sanctify Jonah's heart and bring him to a better kingdom. The whole book has shown us God's surprising methods to give mercy and grace to undeserving people. Jonah shows how God's gracious purposes always succeed, although they often follow a path that is surprising to the human observ observer. And I just wanted to end with, you know, we've done so much hating on Jonah <laughs> because Jonah has been very, it's a very raw book about what happens inside our human hearts. But in the end, I feel that Jonah is a hero and he's a hero to me. And I hope that, um, that I would be able to end up like Jonah as I continue in my journey. And Tim Keller, this is how he ends his book about Jonah and I'm gonna end our study with it because I think it's just great. As we have seen, the book of Jonah ends with a cliffhanger. We are never told how the prophet responded to God's final appeal. I propose, however, that we can make a reasonable guess about how Jonah ultimately responded to God. How do we know Jonah was so recalcitrant, defiant, and clueless? How do we know that he made that unbelievable, I hate the God of love speech? How do we know about his prayer inside the fish? The only way we could possibly know these things is if Jonah told others. What kind of man would let the world see what a fool he was? Only someone who believed that he was simultaneously sinful, but completely accepted. In short, someone who has found in the gospel of grace, the very power of God. If it can change Jonah, it can change anyone. It can change you. Amen. So that's the end of Jonah. Uh, so I still went for as long as I didn't want to go. My apologies. <laughs> um, but I didn't have a, I had a couple discussion questions, but I just figured I didn't know how it would go on Zoom and I didn't know how many people would be here. So I did want to offer the opportunity, um, maybe if someone could pray and then, we could have, if people want to stay on and talk and talk about anything that hit them or whatever, how this might apply to you, that's fine. And also, again, if you have to leave, no one's going to see you get up and go. So you can kind of go whenever you want. Um, so I don't know if maybe we could take like uh, two or three people who might want to share uh, some thoughts, but, you know, keep it to two or three and um, we'll pray and say goodbye for the day. <laughs> so, uh, Camille, are we muted still, everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Hi. 
<laughs> I didn't see you on there before. Okay. I know. I got it late. And by the way, Emily, it was so funny because as, just like five minutes after I got on, I was already cleaning my kitchen. So I had, you made me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I know there's nothing else to do, so home renovations, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally painting my kitchen. I said, like, okay, I'm gonna go out there and talk to somebody about Jesus. It's not gonna be just about me. Okay, so who's 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 listening to Frozen? <laughs> Oh, that's not, sorry, Kendall was watching. <laughs> that's okay. All right. Um, okay. Okay. I think everybody's just about unmuted now. How about, can we have two or three comments on today's lesson? Um, is there any specific question? How are you guys dealing with your emotions in the coronavirus? <laughs> I think that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> so two questions that I was going to ask that I can put out there and you don't have to answer them, but just if it helps you. Um, one of them was why do you find it hard to go to God with your emotions and why? Um, talk about that a little bit. And then another question was going to be which of the kind of steps of self-examination is hardest for you? Like maybe it's like, yeah, I'm good at naming them and I can figure out why they're there, but you know what? I really don't feel like changing them. So I have a hard time with aligning or maybe I have outbursts of emotion and I can't figure out why, or maybe you're in the middle of a situation and you thought about it the whole way through and you just want to share that. So I don't know, you don't have to answer any of those questions, but if that's for some conversation, great. I find that I stay very busy and don't take time to think about it. Like mm -hmm. super busy. Like I have touched everything in my house, cleaned it, moved it, packed it. Hey, baby, baby Bowen. <laughs> little Jonah. Oh my God. Where's our little Jonah? There's our Jonah. <laughs> Hi, Silas. <laughs> Hi, Silas. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Oh my He's always sleeping. Oh, good. That's good. During the day, probably. <laughs> oh, you're me. Oh, God bless him. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to close this in prayer? No. Camille. Can I, can I uh, give a scripture before we close? Yeah, so jump in. And can you close us, Lise, with that? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I had, I had this scripture come to me in a daily devotion I get on my phone every day and it just for some reason kind of had one of those pal experiences where mm -hmm. I felt I have to share this. So it's Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Yeah. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lise. That's really good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for this opportunity to um, just see the faces of my sisters in Christ, and I miss them so much, Lord, and thank you for um, bringing us together. I hope, Lord, that this uh, lesson today has spoken to the hearts of us all in a way that we can um, use these steps to look at our emotions and um, think about the you in the center of them instead of ourselves lord we uh, repent we need to repent of our selfishness mm -hmm. our um, desires lord and we need to place our eyes upon you and lord when we are struggling with um this quarantine time and the isolation help us to just remain um steadfast in our faith for you, knowing that you love us, mm -hmm. knowing that you understand us, mm -hmm. knowing that we can have confidence, Lord, in 
um, your will be done. And protect us all, Lord. Keep us all healthy and safe. And uh, give us other opportunities to share together and see each other's faces in the weeks ahead. Um, and Lord, just bring this to a resolution as soon as uh, your will has been done, Lord. And help us to be patient and um, just trusting you. We pray. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for Emily's time spent on this study, Lord. I know hours and hours go into what she does and how she does it. And Lord, it's always a gift to me personally and I know to many others. And we just ask an extra blessing on her and her household, Lord. She's been a faithful servant to us and uh, we just want to lift her and Dave and uh, Evie and Betsy up to you today and ask that they just um, have a great week ahead. And same for all of you that are tuning in today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Louise. Thank sure. you, Pam. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> say hi. <laughs> what you drinking? Is it good? What you drink? You're drinking. <laughs> Not sure. Okay. <laughs> ah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Stay well, everybody. Stay, Stay well. well. Stay safe. God bless everyone. I'm glad you made it. Oh, a little late, but made it. That's all that counts is that you made it. <laughs> Take care, PK. Love you. Love you, too. I'll talk to you later. Okay. All right. I'm going to end the meeting since I'm the host.